I'm going to be joined now by Bob Cuffins, Chief Product and Technology Officer at the Neiman Marcus Group. We're going to discuss how luxury retail, something we consider just a global glamorous business, has evolved to meet the demands of the digital age. Thank you, Janet. Is that the same walk-up music, Scott, that you have? <laughs> no, I can't tell if it's the same. Mine is supposed to be more exciting uh, than yours? No. Definitely glamorous. And uh, I, I, my connection was I purchased this dress at Neiman Marcus. So well, thank I appreciate you very that. much. Now, you've had a lot of our customers, so thank you for that. Thank you. And um, I appreciate the customer um, service. That's always wonderful. You have had a role in creating very strong customer service experiences at a number of major companies, Apple, eBay, Delta Airlines, now the CTO for Neiman Marcus. And as I mentioned in the opening remarks, we think of Neiman Marcus as just pure glamour, something where you go for your happy place. But tell us about how this is actually a very technology forward company. Yeah, we're actually investing quite a bit in technology and I think that it, it spans the gamut from really what you would consider kind of basic and mundane things to, to really kind of new and out there things, but all focused on trying to drive a highly differentiated customer experience. We're on this digital transformation roadmap and all of these things are a part of it. So, you know, on one end, we're uh, completely rebuilding our physical supply chain and we've got a digital transformation as a part of that, a warehouse management system, an order management system, you know, things that probably most or all retailers uh, struggle with, uh, have an opportunity to struggle with at some point. Uh, I think the other thing is that, you know, we're constantly looking at our customer facing experiences. So the websites, um, I think maybe people saw recently we announced a partnership with Farfetch where we're going to take the Bergdorf Goodman website, replatform that on their new technology platform, and we'll continue to operate our own Neiman Marcus platform. We've got a series of apps and things that we continue to, to optimize. Um, so, so pretty normal stuff. And then we've created and operate a platform we call Connect, which is actually this really incredible platform and app that our sales associates use to clientele and interact with their best customers. You know, Neiman Marcus is such a relationship business. We, um, you know, we just see so much value from maintaining, deepening uh, relationships with our best and most loyal customers that we've given now our sales associates this incredible tool to allow them to do that, communicate more effectively, and then we, uh, just as an example, we're constantly trying to find content for our sales associates to push through and engage with their customers. So things like product recommendations, um, offers, promotions, you know, just like sort of what's coming. Um, and so we bought recently a, a company called Stylize, which was a company that used data science to assemble from uh, all of our inventory the best looks for a customer. And it wasn't just like looks that look good together, these like static things. Actually, I know those customers, I understand their propensity for brands, I understand their propensity for um, you know, things that they bought in the past based on, their, based on their history, and I can then assemble around those items a look, and so now that look is in Connect and, uh, and is able to be pushed to customers. So we're trying to do all these things, like some of them mundane, some of them really advanced, that are all focused on trying to drive an, uh, a really incredible customer experience. And in that process, maybe gently address the customer challenges. For example, if they barely break five feet and they need a dress to wear today. For, for example, yeah. yes. Okay, very much appreciated. You do have a challenge with your customers, or maybe not a challenge, but it's basically a mandate that didn't exist even 20, 30 years ago. And that is you are known for your brick and mortar stores, places yeah. where you go to shop and look at things, but you also have this 24 seven online business. How have you had to deploy technology to address both of these important verticals within yeah. the company? Well, look, I think it's that and the fact that these customers have migrated like traditional sales models of like people walk into a store and they talk to a sales associate and they buy a thing. I mean, they basically just like completely transformed and there certainly is some of that. But I think what we see now more is these relationships allow people to transact across platforms. They sort of migrate across geographies, right? Like sometimes I'm in my this home and sometimes I'm in my this home. That would be nice, but like the, our, many of our customers are on vacation and they're just trying to get what they need at the right time. And so this ability for us to think less about the channel and think more about the customer and the connection and the relationship. That's one of the things that this Connect tool allows us to do because it can transact, it can provide recommendations. We now have the ability inside that platform, if you have our app and our sales associate that you're in a relationship with has Connect, 
you can transact, uh, you can send messages, you can send recommendations, you can like auto, auto video chat, like, oh, I, does this look good? Does it not look good? You know, so, but, but thinking about it from a customer and a relationship standpoint, less from a channel standpoint, because what's happened is that traditional profile of like online only or store only, you know, we, we've sort of viewed this, this, like again, our tool is a, as a third channel almost. It's the thing that sits in between when customers just need something and we want to try to take care of them wherever they are. Well, all these new offerings to the customer means that you have to have sales associates with new skills. <laughs> so how do you train up this modern sales associate that can jump on virtually with their client and give them the real feedback on if it does or does not look good, and as well as interact with them both personally and digitally? Yeah, it's a, actually a really interesting challenge. I mean, the history, not to like go too far back in time, you know, we're all trying to put COVID out of our, our minds, right? And like move forward and be on the, on the, on the forward facing side of everything that we've experienced. But um, part of, of what we experienced in COVID was that we had launched this tool. Uh, we had to close our stores, obviously, as most retailers did, all retailers did. And so what our sales associates were able to do was to use this connect tool and basically just continue the work that they were doing in the stores just remotely. And so for us, it was this really, uh, you know, unfortunate moment where the teams had to really start to embrace and use technology. And the motivation was like, oh, I can still make a commission. I can still make a sale. I keep the business alive. And the way I keep the business alive is by using these digital tools. And so our sales associates had a little bit of a jump start in, in that period to create an incentive for them to use these tools. And then I think, you know, we've been very open to the sales associate feedback and input. Uh, we've been very open to, um, you know, continued adding, you know, new and, and enhanced features. And then we've created actually a whole structure inside the store, a digital sales associate. And so they become effectively the train the trainer in each of those stores that are the digital experts. You know, it's an interesting question that you raised, Janet, because we've considered and we're still thinking about, like, would we put a pool of some of those folks actually not in a store? Like, why do they have to be attached to a store if they're truly a digital sales associate? So we're looking at some different models for how we can use this tool across different populations um, and, and really provide very specific and, and luxury service, which is really what we're all about. You have revealed that Neiman Marcus is spending $200 million in its tech initiatives. You mentioned so many things, including some acquisitions that you made of other companies. Can you tell us where the bulk of that investment will go? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I mean, look, you, you, obviously uh, everybody knows if you do a major supply chain order management, warehouse management transformation, that's significant capital and that's important. The Farfetch implementation is, is a significant one and we'll you know, have over the next, sometime next year, we'll, we'll launch that and we'll be, um, I think, a really great growth platform for, for BG and so we're, that, that's a big piece of it. One thing we, we didn't talk about is we have invested a lot in data science and the uh, opportunity to understand our customers at a much more fundamental level so that we can personalize experience, we can customize. So I, you know, I talked basically about like brand propensity or you know, are you more of a, of, a, of a full price versus not a full price person? And so we can use some of those things, but we've now gotten much deeper in terms of like exactly how those customers sh want to shop, when they, when they shop, what brands they like, and, and being able to make very specific and tailored recommendations across all channels. You know, we send you know, billions of emails. You guys probably on our mailing list, you see your fair share of that. So billions of emails a year. Why are those not tailored and specific and customized? Why are they, you know, sort of, sort of generic? Like we, we have so many impressions on our website. We have all the, the monthly average users on our, on our app. Like those should all be personalized and customized experiences. And that wasn't an infrastructure that we had in house when I, you know, I've been at Neiman Marks a year and a half ago. We had a lot of data, but we didn't have any of that stuff organized in a way that allowed us to draw these conclusions. Um, we also hadn't been able to identify as many customers as we wanted when they came to our digital experience. So like, how do you start to, to increase that number so that all of a sudden what you feel when you come to Neiman Marcus is something that's for me always, you know, and something that's very special and uh, is an extension and an amplification of the work that our sales associates do. Because that's been, you know, that, that's been the hallmark of our business. It's like, how do, we, how do we serve you? And so what's the digital analog of how do we serve you? It has to come through personalization. It has to come through some of these technologies. I want to dig into something that you brought up, and it's something that basically every company in this room and the executives joining us virtually are dealing with right now, and that is the supply chain challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, how bad did it get, and how did you use technology to solve the problems, and what did you learn? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've all been through a lot, obviously. I think we have a bit of an advantage in that much of our product comes from Europe. 
and much of our product already was was air air freight, you know, and so we we didn't quite have the same sort of. Um, uh, stickiness that I think a lot of the other folks in the industry had, um, but what we know is that our customers have the same expectations that customer that they have of other retailers, right? So when you have folks that are like, "Hey, order by five, you can get it today," it's like, "Oh, okay. Well, we're not we're not there." And so, mm -hmm. how do we start to put technology against that? You know, one is just this kind of core uh, operational systems, but then how do you start to think about priority? How do you start to think about like personalizing supply chain? So as a loyalty member, do you get same-day service for free? Is that something we can operationalize in the facility to sort of pull your order, cross-dock, you know, through the facility in a way that allows customers to, to get something that feels, again, special and differentiated? We're trying to take the, the same mindset that we have around customer experience and apply it to our, all of our operational processes, supply chain, and, and um, among others. Um, you know, we've, we, we think that just doing the operational work we're doing in supply chain can reduce our time to customer by two, three days on average. Mm -hmm. And so we know we have to do that, but what, but what else, you know? And so what are these sort of personalization approaches applied to supply chain and how does that work around things like pre-orders, around, um, you know, like special releases for loyalty customers and sort of tying that customer expectation all the way back in and through the supply chain. Uh, we have an excellent question that's come in from the audience, and it actually relates, in my opinion, to supply chain issues. Also, the changing oh, yeah. demands that you experience at a business like Neiman Marcus. It's seasonal at times. Yeah. People shop more than others. So this question has to deal with the challenges of Neiman Marcus addressing the work from home, working from remote versus returning to office. Yeah. I can imagine, number one, buying habits changed. Yeah. People weren't buying as many shoes. Perhaps they were maybe concentrating on the waste up. What other challenges did you see, and how did that impact what you needed to stock yeah. with what people wanted to buy? Yeah, I'm not a merchant, but I but I I feel this every day. You know, it's interesting. The patterns definitely changed, and again, I I need to stop saying COVID because like you know everybody hates that. But and, and we're all moving forward, right? We're moving forward. Um, but in that moment, some some things changed. To your point, like we didn't have big events. Not all the you know not all the things that people used to come and buy outfits for were happening. And so those, those behaviors and those patterns really changed. We did shift our assortment more towards, not like athleisure exactly, but you know, we had more items that were more uh, aligned to like working at home and, and trying to still feel luxury and still feel fancy and still feel like you, know, you, you had a sense of style, but just not at the event and not at the gala. And that, you know, so we, were, we did adjust the assortment a little bit. I think the other phenomenon that we saw is that a lot of folks were very interested in um, high ticket fashion single items that had mm. scarcity. So things like that handbag drop that only had X number of handbags or the, that shoe drop that only had X number of shoes. And so we saw uh, through the pandemic a, a real increase in those kinds of customers coming to Neiman Marcus for the inventory that we bought. And so our merchants do such an incredible job of they're actually in Paris and, and Milan right. this, this week, this past week. And so, you know, they do such an incredible job of really seeing the trend, um, finding the things that they believe and understand our customers are gonna, are gonna value. Um, and then, you know, we, we're obviously trying to adjust to, to the times, but I think the good news is many of those events are back. And so we're finding this situation where we now have the customers we gained through COVID and the, and the, and the modes of buying and the things that people came to Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman for will remain and we're starting to get some of those, the, you know, the event business back. And so when we start to see these new seasons come in, I think we'll have an opportunity to take advantage, hopefully, of both of those, both of those trends, like return to normal and some of these new models. Also, since you are the chief technology officer, bringing up another challenge that we don't think about, but your season in Dallas is different from your new season <laughs> in Boston, and your totally. customers there are, are different as well. So that's a lot of data that you have to analyze yeah. in order to be efficient, unless you want to keep shipping things at high rate around your different stores. Yeah, we do. I mean, we do actually, because there's such a scarcity model mm -hmm. in luxury, we actually do a fair amount of shipping around. You know, we try to put as much inventory in the right places the first time, obviously. Um, and so we push it out to stores. But if we have an online order for a thing that happens to be at a BG store in New York, and that order came from California on the NM app, you know, like there it goes, because I think that's what we want to do to optimize our customer experience and deliver things that people really that people really value. So breaking down what we've already discussed, you have multiple workforces that you have to maintain within Neiman Marcus. You have, you know, product merchandising, marketing, you have the sales associates that are interfacing directly with the customers, you have tech workers. Given the tight labor market, same question that I asked the last panel, how do you find 
people and how much upscaling internally now yeah. do you have to do in order to meet these demands? Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, obviously it's a great question and the one that we all struggle with mightily, I think I maybe would give a little bit of a similar answer, which is that um, it's about culture on one hand. You know, culture is very important. We, uh, our CEO uh, always starts with, we lead with love. Mm -hmm. And when you lead with love, it implies a lot of things that you do as an organization. And so that means talent and, and uh, leadership development. It means inclusiveness. It means, um, you know, really focused on, on policies and the priorities for what we think our team values. You know, so we recently la launched, for example, a parental leave program that's, you know, world class. You know, we very focus on ESG. So lead with love for us creates a culture and a way of working that feels, we think it feels differentiated and it gives us an opportunity to not only talk about the cool technology that we're building or the cool customer experiences or how great luxury is or Balenciaga and oh my God, you know, like we get to talk about the culture and the way of working. In a, really, in a really fundamental way. I think um, the other thing that we did was we really made a decision early, uh, even, even pre-2000, uh, to allow remote working in a very fundamental way. And so through, you know, through the pandemic, all through now, we basically hire in a geographically indiscriminate way. And so I have a team, um, my CIO uh, is in Minneapolis, uh, the, the CEO of Stylize, when we bought her company, she lives in Seattle, I have a, a, a product leader in, um, in Los Angeles, and uh, folks in my uh, design leaders in New York, so you just sort of look at this profile, and this is talent that we wouldn't have been able to attract or, or bring into the company if we had a model, I think somebody said it, like if we forced everybody to move to Dallas, right? Like I live in California, so I don't live in Dallas either. And so I think this opportunity to think about how we put teams together of talented, uh, you know, sort of functional leaders, like just incredible like leadership Mm -hmm. focus um, and then build these locations where we can gather when we need to gather to support those kinds of uh, the, just some some things that are better in person yeah. like as much as much as I hate to say it because I'm in California and I love my zoom, my <laughs> zoom or teams or whatever we're on but um, you know there's some things that are better in person so we built a hub in in uh, Bangalore India mm -hmm. we built a hub in New York we're opening a hub here in Dallas later in the year and so we're gonna have these places where people can gather but at the end of the day you just are where you are and that's what we think with a culture running through that, uh, attracts the best attracts the best talent. One final question: We only have a few minutes left. You've already brought up so many interesting things that you're working on. Looking forward, how do you think that technology will continue to evolve the business of Neiman Marcus? And part of that is almost making the technology invisible to the customer. Right. Right. No, it has to be. I think people don't they don't want to learn how to use platforms. They don't want to learn how, how to you know manage our app interfaces and so you know they, they don't want to understand that when they when they go from one platform to another something changes like it's just nobody has tolerance for that and they shouldn't and so our job is to make that technology seamless for us the thing that is equally important is not to replace a sales associate with technology but to enhance and amplify a sales associate through technology these folks are style oriented they create their own content they, they're passionate about their customers. They're passionate about the brands that they sell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do, a, we do every month, our leadership team at Neiman Marcus goes into market and goes to a store. And we have a meeting together to meet, but we also like interact with the store team. And the pride that these stores have around the companies and the brands that are selling in their stores is truly amazing. So they're the experts, and they're the ones with the most passionate energy. So we let the digital and the technology sort of push them out into the world. And that's sort of how we think about that. And then, you know, I guess the other, for me, the other thing is just we have to continue to explore, like we bought Stylize, we have to continue to explore advanced technology. So data science is a piece of that. You know, AI, I don't want to like go into a big, I could, like Scott, I could talk forever about AI, but like, you know, AI, but also like um, augmented reality is a piece of what we think, you know, how we talk about style in the future. I think there are these, um, you know, just some really interesting trends in the in the in the reusable components of, of generative AI, and so like, how do we start to think about like what do those mean for a customer experience? So I think we've got a lot of we've got some innovation thoughts, but you know, obviously a, a focus on the things that we need to deliver now and and how that enhances our customer experience. In the last minute, someone just asked, "What's the next big thing that retail needs to do to maintain their customers?" <laughs> because we do know like that the, that it's like fickle. The, I know like that's the billion, probably another the multi, panel. The multi-billion yes. dollar question. <laughs> I Look, know. I think, I mean, again, not to like overplay it, but I think if you build a relationship with a customer, you know, we know that customers in a relationship have uh, uh, 10x the customer lifetime value of the of one-off single-channel customers. 
So if you just if you believe that, and, you, and your focus as a business is on customer lifetime value, then build relationships, deepen relationships, find ways to use the customer data to create personalized and customized experiences. I think that's the path that we're on. There's a very small set at Neiman Marcus of what, what we call HVCs, like really, really high spenders, and we do some very specific tailored in-store things for those customers. You're welcome to join that group if you'd like. Um, I'm probably way under the threshold, <laughs> but I'd like to aspire to that. Um, and so I think it's, you know, how do you protect and deepen those relationships is, is definitely, uh, you definitely got to be the center.